and that's really where where my journey began. Um, and in fact, I, I write about that in the uh, a note in, in a note from the author, the the a note at the beginning of the book, um, that 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 is where I really began to contemplate the the uh, the, the the theology uh, and the and the uh, the reality of Adam and Eve and what exactly was the purpose of mankind and where was all of this headed and what 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 exactly was the mission of Christ and so and I always tell people that 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 those thoughts um, were uh, those thoughts uh, were natural they were they were a naturally occurring it was a naturally occurring thought process uh, to contemplate Eden when you're when you're living in the Amazon because you're just absolutely uh, you're in, you're uh, ensconced in in life in in vegetation and just all kinds of, of life forms all around you all the time and so um, I can I can remember specifically actually one particular morning when I was pacing back and forth by the side of a river the river was called Sara. I even remember the name of the river, even though this was quite a long time ago, and um, and it was just the, the 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 depth of the gospel of Christ was just rocking me. Just it was just really exploding in my mind and realizing who we are as human beings. What what realizing what it means to be a human being. The the significance of mankind in the story of creation. And our relationship to uh, to the earth, and our mandate on earth, and really that's where the the kernels, uh, the the seeds for for this book really were planted in my mind. And it took me a long time. I mean, it took me a long. It took me you know, twenty years, almost twenty some years, over twenty five years before I really began to uh, organize my thoughts. And and when I began to write this book, I actually didn't set out to write a book about the things that I just mentioned. I, I set out to write a book about uh, really focusing on the um, the post-human paradigm and the technologies that are arising and so forth. And, and when I and when I began to write, that's not what came out. What came out was all that stuff that I had been contemplating in the jungle so many years before. That's what started to come out, and I realized that in order to work my way up to to be able to talk about a post-human condition, to be able to um, articulate the dynamics involved in in a scenario in the future in which the human the the the, the human race is no longer human, in which mankind evolves out of Adam, I had to first go back and lay the theological groundwork for what it means to be Adam. That that was. That was the prerequisite uh, before I could talk about uh, the post-human paradigm and, and, and also other topics such as the, the alien question and so forth. So uh, that was that's kind of a snapshot of the journey of writing this book. And, um, you know, and that led me to in, into all kinds of topics that I that I, I weave my, I weave my way through all kinds of topics, starting not not with Adam, starting from before Adam in a pre-Adamic context, and then moving forward, um, talking about a lot of things, you know, addressing the Genesis six, the Genesis six affair, but from a very, I, I would say, a very unique angle, um, and then moving forward, it, talking about the um, uh, the machinations of 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 the of the uh, the priests of Cain, as I call them. In modern times, and and uh, working my way all the way up to Armageddon, which is where the book ends. Well, if you don't mind, um, <clears throat> this is like one of my favorite subjects, um, and you know, I, I, you know, we we all go, go through. Well, I don't want to say we all go through similar journeys, but I, I, you know, for those of us who are interested 
in a renewed cosmology associated with our existence and we put we plug the biblical dynamic into a, an existence of universes, universes. Uh, I'm not talking about a single universe. I'm talking about multiple universes, multiple realms, multiple dimensions, trillions of life forms. Um, uh, you know, um, when, when you start to look at the, uh, the, the scope of what we're dealing with here um, as, a, as, a, as a part of the, you know, the, our existence and you understand that the biblical narrative is really just kind of a teensy weensy little snapshot in time associated, you know, kind of, it's just, a, if you will, for lack of a better term, injected into probably uh, billions, if not more, uh, of years of, of uh, you know, the universe's, ex you know, existence. Okay, then it opens up, um, you know, it, I, see, at first I felt a little bit intimidated. You know, when I, you know, because I come from, you know, um, I come from, a, you know, going back all the way into the 60s and 70s, I go back, you know, a, you know, with a, with kind of like a, a Pentecostal upbringing and all that kind of stuff. And I, and I never really had all that much of a fascination with, um, you know, the universe and all that kind of stuff. And then as, as my journey continued, it was like, I don't know, it wasn't by volunteer. I didn't like raise my hand and say, dear Heavenly Father, please teach me all this stuff about the universe and all that kind of stuff. What happened was, I call it a mini miracle. An event occurred at my desktop while I was at work. It shouldn't have happened, but did, and it was absolutely mind bending. And I'll just leave you with this. The super. I wrote an article about it many years ago, over 11 years ago, but um. I was sitting at a desk. I work. I work in cybersecurity. I was working in cybersecurity at the time, and back there there was a lot of um, banter and stuff associated with uh, Stephen Greer's operation and the Disclosure Project, which is what he called it at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and I was sitting at my desk, and I just happened to be studying or doing some research on what's known as botnets. Botnets are a big part of doing cybersecurity work, <clears throat> and there was a three-dimensional uh, depiction put on this website that we're, uh, you know, using various electronics, trick, electronic methods. They had the people that created this website probably associated, who knows, with, with which three, which, whichever three-letter agency or whatever, but they had created a map, um, a visual map of all the botnets and the bots that they could detect worldwide. And you could actually take your mouse and scroll the rolly wheel and kind of almost like fly through the, this 3D depiction, you know, of all these botnets. And you could stop and you could turn your mouse to the right and go over and, and look at this botnet and see that it's connected to one in Russia. It's connected to the Chinese this. It's connected to that. And you could see this relationship. So they built this electronic relationship map that's three-dimensional. And then I kind of got bored with it. And I took my mouse and I started rolling it really, really fast because I was like, I got to get to the end of this. <laughs> you know, just kind of a dumb thing, right? And I, I started scrolling, scrolling, scrolling as fast as I could, as fast as I could. And I mean, these little bot, you know, things are just flying past me to the left, to the right, to the left, to the right, to the left, to the right. And I finally come to the very end. And right there in front of me, bam, is the very last bot. And my mouth drops to the ground. I mean, I was like, I was stupefied. <laughs> the title of the host, the name of the host of the bot at the very end of as far as I could go was entitled thedisclosureproject.org. And I was like, no way. And it was shortly thereafter that I added the we'll just call it the alien phenomenon as a petal on my Venn diagram. So I had already started a research Venn diagram in my office on a very large whiteboard on an easel. And I did not have the, you know, I really hadn't come to a point in my walk where I was able to reconcile the otherworldly being phenomenon with the Bible. And so I was like your typical pastor 
holding hands with his son, walking through the Museum of Science and Industry, past a seven-foot-tall Neanderthal man, and just kind of brushing it off like, uh, yeah, yeah, sure, sure, son, that must have been, you know, <laughs> you know, not not even, you know, discrediting mm. the uh, – Carbon dating. That's things. That's those are the kind of things that that six thousand year old you know Earth Christians are famous for. They'll say, well, carbon dating can't be trusted. This can't be trusted. That can't be trusted. You know, anything that date that doesn't fit their biblical cosmology can't be trusted. It's a lie. And of course, those of us who have much more expansive understandings of things recognize that no, it's not a lie. That the things that are in the Bible are true. But everything that's true is not in the Bible. And then that that's expands right. mm-hmm. your scope. You know what I mean? It gets exciting. Absolutely. So like, what are some that's of a great statement. That's a great statement because the Bible, the, you know, people have told me, uh, I, I've, I've, and I'm sure you've gotten this plenty of times as well, is, well, that's not in the Bible. Uh, that's that, There's nothing about that in the Bible. So, you know. I don't know about it. We don't really have to worry about it. Well, our daily lives, most of the things that we interact with in our daily lives are not in the Bible. I mean, there are no automobiles in the Bible. There are no airplanes in the Bible. There's no Internet in the Bible. There's no TV in the Bible. Um, uh, None of that is – I mean, we we could not have anticipated any of the technologies technologies that we have today specifically um, by reading the Bible. It's because the Bible isn't there to tell us about everything in the universe. The Bible exists to communicate the gospel of Christ to mankind. That is the purpose of the Bible. And that's the primary purpose of the Bible. There's secondary purposes as well. But the primary purpose of the Bible is, 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 the, is a communication from the, from the maker himself regarding the gospel of Christ. So it's a communication from the Father to mankind regarding the gospel of his son and and it pertains to the the it pertains to the redemption um the reconciliation and the rectification of mankind in the family of god it's the it's the it's the uh the antidote to to adam to the to fallen adam and and that is what that is what that is the main uh, purpose of the Bible. Now, of course, there's all kinds of prophetic content in the Bible, and the Bible does make astounding predictions, and it's always correct. Uh, no other document has ever, uh, no other ancient document has ever been able to predict uh, the future uh, with the kind of accuracy of the of the Hebrew Scriptures. Not even close. So, and that is and that is uh, the verification. That's the validation that the message is true. And it's not just another ancient text. And, and, and so the, the, the prophecy is the validation that the message is true, and the message is the gospel of Christ. And that is the, communicate, the primary communication to mankind from God. And so all these other things, all, the, all these other things are ancillary. Um, you know, it always amazes me that, uh, that, that, that Jesus, the Son of God, who the Bible call, who the Bible describes as, in modern terms, we would call him the singularity. That's what I call him in my book. I call him the singularity, the Son of God, because the singularity in modern terms, in modern physics, is the is that point of infinite density and gravity and so forth that exploded at the beginning of the Big Bang, that that created everything, which which of course is ridiculous. But 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 if you identify that singularity, that event. As, Christ, as the Son of God, then, then now you're within the biblical narrative, because that is exactly how the apostles described him, that he is the beginning. And not only is he the, he, not only is he the beginning of the universe, he's the, he's the source of the universe. Uh, he's the reason why the universe exists. I mean, it's all created uh, through him and by him and for him, is what Paul says in First Colossians. And so um, when you begin to realize that, that, uh, that the, the purpose of the universe, it's not – we're not it, that mankind, we're not the center of the yeah. universe. We are not the hey. center Hallelujah. of created order, that we're not the center of created order. That is not a biblical doctrine. That's called anthropocentrism. 
That's, that's a human-centric perspective. The Bible does not teach anthropocentrism, or what I call the anthropocentric perspective. The Bible clearly teaches Christocentrism. It teaches a, a Christ-centered perspective, a Christocentric perspective, that Christ is the center of all things. He is at the very center of the universe. It exists because of him. It was created through him, and, 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 and this is the most important part. It was made for him. We are ancillary characters in his story. And when you begin to view the gospel from that angle, when you begin to, to, to have the pr- correct doctrinal perspective of the universe, the Christocentric perspective, then, then accommodating, you can accommodate all kinds of things into the biblical narrative, and they have no bearing whatsoever on the gospel of Christ, like extraterrestrials, for example. Because, uh, because Christ is the center of the universe— the, 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 the story of creation is his story. He is the protagonist. We are not the protagonist in the story. He is the protagonist in the story. We are secondary characters in his story. And, and again, when you begin to view the gospel from this perspective, the biblical narrative, and this is the biblical perspective, and, it, it, and nobody could ever uh, argue against this because there are just an overwhelming amount of scriptures in the New Testament that uh, that uh, verify this that this is indeed um, right doctrine that that, no, this, is. that Christocentrism is the doctrine uh, of the New Testament. But you know what's so cool? So then, as as I went through my journey, which sounds almost like there, there I believe me, you and I, you know, if we had four hours together, we would be going nuts. But um, but yeah, when you I tell people this all the time, the problem is. We have a dorked up glossary of terms. We are very egocentric. We are very prideful. We just to your point, we it, it we don't think Christ centric. We think us centric. We think we're the only pebble on the beach. Mm-hmm. We're the only sons of God in all of creation, which is a bunch of boulder dash. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I try to explain. To, I try to explain to people: you got to change your glossary of terms. It's got to be changed. You know, when when um, for example, north, south, east, and west. We think about it from from the earth. I'm standing on earth. I have a compass, north, south, east, west. No. In God's vernacular, north, south, east, and west is inclusive of various parts of the universe. When, 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 when the various kings of Israel were going to give incense and drink offers and things like that, and they were going, you know, up to their high places on the roofs and stuff like that to give them to the quote hosts of heaven. They were doing it to alien beings. They weren't doing it to the planet. So that's the problem. The pastors of the churches they don't have the glossary of terms. They don't have the expansive understanding of what it should, what those hosts of heaven are actually referring to. See, so the typical biblical enthusiast would say. Genesis 6, 4, sons of God came down on into the daughter of men and bore children under them, and there were giants in the earth in those days, yada, yada, blah, blah, and that kind of thing. I don't do that. I'm like, hey, that is one incursion. What gives you the impression that there weren't a hundred other incursions just like that? People always, they get wrapped up in this. They're like, okay, like... See, it says there were giants in the, in, in, on the earth after that. And I joke, I tell people all the time, think about it, please, just for a second. What, what, what did, did a giant grab a snorkel and hold on to the bottom of Noah's Ark and snorkel for, you know, his way across until the, you know, until the Mount Ararat? And but then they come up with this theory. Well, it's got to be because there was corrupted genome that was brought on to the ark, you know, with Noah's family. And there's nothing to base that on at all, nothing. And I, and I'm like, listen, why in the world would you think that there was only one incursion? Why does it have to be a singular event? I was studying one uh, writing that was based on some very ancient text that the implication of the writing, which I believe is true, by the way, is that the land of Canaan. Didn't wasn't they weren't Adamic. They didn't come from Esau. It wasn't it wasn't that simple. That there were actually beings 
that made up the land of Canaan that were not from earth originally. And um, but anyway, it, it gets you know, that, and then it starts that kind of merges back into Atlantis, Lemuria, Mirror, the, the you know the four hundred thousand years of the uh, you know the the uh, Sumerian kings list, the the incursion of the Anunnaki on the Earth, and they're dorking around with the various uh, you know reptilian species and all that kind of weirdness. But but when you see, I used to be like, I remember when I didn't believe in any of the the alien stuff. You know, and and I was like, and I got this book because I wanted to understand Nostradamus's four set of quatrains, and he, he was under a lot of. They wanted to kill him then. By the time he got to the last group of quatrains, they were hunting him down. You know, the Roman Catholic Church wanted him dead, and mm-hmm. so he did everything in Pictionary. And so uh, I bought this one book. It was touted as being one of the better, you know, explanation slash renditions interpretations of Nostradamus's final effort at Pictionary. And it had a big section of an alien invasion coming on the earth. And I remember I got to that chapter and I was like, oh, for crying out loud. I picked up the book and I remember I whipped it across the room and I'm like, this is bunk. And the funny thing about it is. Over the last 10 years, it has become my specialty. In Isaiah 13, our Heavenly Father sends a massive alien invasion upon the earth during the day of the Lord to punish the unrighteous. They chop, they ravage your wives, and they chop your children into pieces. These aren't Palestinians. They come from the far ends of the Shamayim. The heaven, the outer mm. space. If you look at the New King, the, I'm sorry, the King James Enhanced Concordance, it even says where the planets revolve. It's very explicit. Mm. Very it's amazing. Yeah. It, yeah, it's right there. And when you realize that that was a major part of the whole big, the whole story, <laughs> and then does it make you feel small? Well, some Christians it does. I remember when I felt small. I was like, wow, that kind of takes away from my puffed up impression of how important I am. Mm -hmm. And the more I looked at it, it was the opposite. It made it bigger. Ruling and reigning with Jesus Christ over all of creation is humongous. It's amazing. Well, when you you realize how expansive the universe is in created order, and you realize that Within this, all of the myriads of sentient beings that, that, that probably exist. I mean, you look at the Earth, look how many different kinds of insects there are just on planet Earth, just in one uh, biosphere on planet Earth. Um, this is a very creative maker. I mean, God is very creative. He loves life. He loves to create life. And if we think that God, who, is, who we can't even fathom his mind, we can't fathom the mind of God, that he would restrict himself to only creating life on earth, I think is illogical. It's irrational. And so, uh, when, but, when we, but when we remove ourselves uh, from, the, 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 from center stage, when, when we can contemplate the universe without having to be the purpose of it, the point of it, um, the, the main character, and when we can appropriately put Christ in his place and allow the Son of God to be the to be not only the, the, the primal source, but the primary purpose of the universe, you know, the, 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 prim, the primary protagonist in the story, then, then, then it, 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 everything becomes, um, every, we can accommodate all of these ideas uh, quite comfortably. And then we realize that, you know, Adam, um, in, in, this, in this potential um, uh, panoply of, of, of living creatures that exist in the universe, you have Adam being created on the earth for a very specific function. But, but Adam is created for two primary reasons. First and foremost, he's created for fellowship with the Father. He's created to have fellowship in the family of God. That's number one. Number two, he's created to govern the earth, specifically to govern the earth. Those are the reasons for which he was created. And, and Adam wasn't just created to be another sentient being on the planet. He was a son of God. And that is, 
exactly how the Bible describes him in the genealogy of Jesus of Nazareth. You get all the way to Adam, the son of God. And so Adam was created to be a member in the family. And he wasn't the only member of that family. He had older siblings. And this is the prodigal, which we probably don't have time to go through today, but this is the parable of the prodigal son. And I encourage your listeners to go and take a look at it from that perspective. And so uh, we were created to be in the family. Now, that doesn't, you're not, I'm not saying that we are gods and all of that. That's not, that's not uh, what I'm saying. I'm saying that we are exactly what the Bible calls us, that, we, that Adam in the beginning was a son of God, and that Christ gives us the power to become the sons of God. And that power is called the resurrection, where we're reset to the blueprint of Adam. And we're, we're brought back into the family of God. And so when you consider the, the expansive, uh, mind-boggling immensity of the universe and, and of God's creation, and then you recognize that we were not just one of the created beings. We were supposed to be part of the family. We're, 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 we're part, we're, we're part of, the, of the ruling class. That's what we were supposed to be in the beginning. It, it doesn't diminish mankind by any means. To the contrary, it, it elevates us to our proper position in the hierarchy of creation, which is yes! a little lower than the angel. Exactly <laughs> as so David says, yes. exactly as David says, that, that we were created to be a little lower than the a- angels. And that's because, and, and, you know, and this is what I, 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 I talk about in the beginning of my book, that's because the angels are our elder siblings. They're also right. called sons of God. And that's so right. that's not that that term, the term son of God, sons of God is not incidental. It's a term of it's a familial term. It's a it's a term of family. Yeah. And there's a reason why they're called and there's a reason why the angels rejoice, by the way, when a sinner repents. Why? Because because it's the parable of the prodigal son, because the younger brothers are coming home. They're going to be reunited. The fellowship that was broken is, is going to be reconciled. And that's exactly what Christ does. He reconciles us to God and to the family of God. And so uh, in, in, back into the family of God, he restores us to what was lost in Adam. Everything that was lost in Adam is regained in, in Christ. And that's part of the gospel. And that's the message of the scriptures, a message directed to us. And so... When you read the Bible, if, you, if you're an adherent to the scriptures, to the Hebrew scriptures, then you automatically accept right out of the gates, you automatically presuppose the existence of extraterrestrials right out of the gates. Because we're introduced in the very first uh, book of the Bible to these entities who are called angels. And these entities are not us. They're not human beings. And they're clearly not from the earth. Not and so what indigenous. does that make them? Right. <laughs> it makes them extraterrestrials. Oh, yeah. And it, it, it's a, it's, it's, it is a biblical paradigm. This isn't – everybody kind of uh, uh, cowers in fear and, and ducks and dodges the term extraterrestrial. Why? Anything that is not any, – any being that whose provenance is not planet Earth is by definition extraterrestrial. Right. Angels were not created from the substance of the earth. Adam was created from the substance of the earth. Human yep. beings are terrestrial. The other sons of God are extraterrestrial. And so uh, this, is, this is the presupposition that's built into the biblical narrative. And yet so many Christians choke on it. And I don't understand. And I really, you know, uh, and, and, you know I can say, I was almost going to say I don't understand why, but I do understand why, because I choked on it. A while I'll, back, I'll, before I, before sure I had to deal with it. this reality. So. Sure was. I got it. I got to share. I got to. I got to share. I got to share. Now, whether you know this or not already, that's totally cool. If you do, and if you don't, and you, and you disagree, that's totally cool either. Uh, you know, I, I'm. I'm. Uh, you know, I'm not like you know, one of those people who goes. Ah, ah, you know, get all upset. But, um, I can tell you this. It took me years before the Lord was able to grill this into my head. Lots of supernatural confirmations. I mean, oh my gosh, could I write a book just about the supernatural confirmations? 
one of which included a Pentecostal pastor who was very well known, had, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of, of subscribers on his YouTube thing, wrote multiple books, invited on many radio shows. I think one of them was uh, Coast to Coast AM. And um, uh, he came on this program uh, a couple of times, and we got real friendly with him. We liked him a whole lot. Um, I don't like to mention names, particularly when it's something that he might consider to be sensitive. And for all I know, he's listening. Um, but um, he dealt with, let's just put it this way, as part of his Pentecostal upbringing, he spent quite a bit of time in Dulcie, um, re, you know, bringing people to Jesus during their alien festivals and things like that. Now, in, he, we had brought him on the program to talk about his book multiple times and stuff, and it was, you know, wonderful, good stuff. Well, I had a co-host back then. His name was Kenneth. And long story short, I get a call from Kenneth right after we had this particular pastor on the program. It's a couple of days later. And Kenneth goes, you are not going to believe what pastor so-and-so said to me. And I'm like, what? And he goes, he told me that the Lord confirmed and told him that we are, in fact, those who are being referenced in Psalms 82. But he is afraid to tell his congregation because he figures they're going to walk out on him, and he doesn't want to freak them out. I had already been telling people that we are the ones in Psalms 82, and the only reason that Psalm 82 belongs in the Bible at all is because it's talking about us. It says, God stands in the congregation of the mighty, he judges amongst the gods, little g gods. By the way, our Heavenly Father, the Most High, El El Yon, is God of gods, Yahweh El. Okay, then it goes on. It, there's a little bit of a judgment phraseology that goes in there. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to wicked, yada, 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 yada. But let's get down to the meat. Then in verse 6, it says, this is our Heavenly Father speaking. He's still giving the judgment to the minor gods. He says, I said, ye are gods. And all of you are children of the Most High, sons of God, children of the Most High, sons of God, children of the Most High, sons of God, children of the Most High. But you shall die like men. But you shall die like men. Now, how does a minor God, which has eternal life, die like a man? Simple. They have to incarnate into a man. What happened in Genesis 2-7? The Lord God Yahweh Elohim breathed his capital S living soul spirit into the nostrils of of Adam. What happens to us at conception? How did Jesus know it's before the foundations of the earth? Why is there such things as such as predestination? Why does Psalm 139 verse 16 talk about Jesus knowing us and knowing all of the works that we are going to do before we were even born on the earth? Why is that supported by Ephesians 2, 15, 2, 2, uh, 10, uh, 10, 20, or uh, 20, yeah, 10, 20, 20, 10. But anyway, the point is, uh, it might be 2, 10. But anyway, um, the point is, the reality that where it really gets interesting is that it's bigger than everything that you said. Absolutely. I could not agree more. A thousand percent. Oregon was ostracized. He was one of the church fathers with the uh, Roman Catholic Church, which, of course, I'm not a really big fan of for many reasons. But anyway, he was ostracized, which made me especially interested in his dynamics. And he told, because he came forward and he told the papacy that he believed that the scripture strongly supported preexistence. He gave him the scriptures to support it. How in the world could God hate Esau? It's talking about preexistence. He hated him before he was incarnated into a human body. But you're, but then people will fight against this, and they'll say, well, that isn't true because it is appointed to man to die once and then face judgment. Wait a minute. Look at your words carefully. It is appointed to a man to die once and then face judgment. Not a minor God. Not a minor God. And so what we do is we say to ourselves – we, we're, we're so used to getting beat up by the church and their tiny little thimble-mindedness way of looking at everything that we cower. We cower before them, and we go like, well, no, you know, maybe we're not this, maybe this didn't happen, maybe, 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 you know, because we don't want to – no, no. <laughs> They're the ones who are mistaken. We did exist before the earth. 
there is a such thing as predestination. Now, at least some of us, maybe not every single one of us, were definitely chosen and given specific jobs to do. We brought many people on this program that had been that had what what's referred to as NDEs, but they're not really. They did die. They died for real. They were dead. And when they died, they got out of their body like a car down, and they were shocked at how great they felt. They went to heaven, they met Jesus, and people knew them. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people in heaven came running out that they had never seen before, ever. Handing them gifts and welcoming them, welcoming them back home. Back home to their first estate. See, the church would have you believe that we were just little spirit babies floating around in bubbles. No. It's wrong. That's why Psalm 82 is here. It is in this Bible not to throw us for a loop, not to confuse us. Oh, and by the way, how can I confirm that? Because you know the Bible always confirms itself, right? All right, let's do that. How about John verse 1034, where Jesus looks over at the Pharisees and says, Have I not said ye are gods? So you see, Jesus was referring to Psalm 82. He says, does it not say in your law that I said, I said, Jesus said that ye are gods. So he confirms it himself. So that adds a lot to this story associated with the point that you had just made in regard to this this fantastic brotherhood that is associated with the fact that we're all ultimately sons of God. In fact, Lucifer is a son of God by definition. And I, what, and I have, I've tried to help people understand, you know, people would say like, well, and here's the de- the definition that I came up with with a son of, for a son of God is a son of God is any being that is created by the heavenly office of God for the purpose of working for the heavenly office of God. Which means that we are royalty in the universe of beings. Which well, is I, I, would, I, would, I would simplify that definition and I would say that sons of God are those beings which are created to be a part of the family. Yes. And who are who are supposed to be a part of the family, designed to be a part of the family from the beginning. And and, and in my book, I make a, um, I I talk about the image of God, and 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 I make a I make a uh, a, a correlation to the, to the to the image of God and being a son of God. That all of the son, that's why the sons of God look the same. That's why that's why men look like angels. Angels look like men. Because we're part of the same family, and I and there's actually a lot of there's a lot of theological footing there, and I laid out in my book. Um, now I would disagree with you about Psalm 82. I would take the position that Psalm 82 is in fact talking about the other sons of God, that it's talking about the, uh, the you know, for lack of a better term, the angels, um, and a specific a specific maybe we can say rank of angels as a specific uh, faction of angels uh, who were derelict in their, in their, uh, in their duty that, that were uh, not I performing, I agree with that. not performing I agree with the, the mandate that they were given. And in fact were apostate. Um, and, 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 and then I would, and then I would, I would definitely disagree with the notion that we are, uh, that we have preexisted. In the sense, uh, and I don't know if this is what you were saying, but but that that we were um, that we've been in a sense, and, I, and correct me if I'm wrong, if this isn't what you're saying, uh, that we that we've been in a sense essentially uh, reincarnated in a way. No, 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 um, no, 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 incarnated, incarnated. Okay, there's a humongous okay, incarnated, difference. right? But we preexisted no, we, in another yeah, form, is what so we can agree to disagree, dude. This is totally cool. I have no problem with that. It it took me almost uh, six, seven years of supernatural experiences with the Lord, confirmations from people who had no idea 
any of this stuff, pastors of churches, it took me a long time before the Lord was able to show me all this stuff. And that's totally cool. So I am, there's no offense taken whatsoever. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. But I am definitely here to tell you that we did exist before we came to this earth. We were part of the original Luciferian rebellion. And, 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 and so when you say that we, we are closer to the angels, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and all that kind of stuff, you're absolutely right. And that is our family. Absolutely. And part of why we are here, why are we on this prison planet? It wasn't because some chick ate an, ape, an apple for crying out loud. Anybody who believes that is really not seeing the bigger picture here. It is far, far larger than what happened in the Garden of Eden. Okay, but that, but that in and, and, and I would agree with I would I would de- I would certainly agree with that statement. Yeah, and 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 you know what? And and without even get into it, again, you know the. the it, it's really kind of like it, – it's kind of the journey. It's part of the journey. You don't have to believe it right now. You don't have to ever believe it. It's totally cool if you don't believe it. I don't care. It's irrelevant to me. It doesn't matter. But I just wanted to share that with you because what you said is essentially correct. The, pro, the only thing that you're missing is that we were a part of that group, which is why Jesus looked at the Pharisees and said, Have I not said ye are God? It's as simple as that. Jesus said it. If Jesus says it, I believe it. He's God. He's the creator, just like you said he was. John 1, 1, 2, and 3. Boom, the word. He created it all. Well, if he's going to look at the Pharisees and say that I said that you are gods, does it not say in your law that I said that you are gods? And he's making a direct reference to Psalm 82. That sounds pretty conclusive to me. I say jury's, jury's dismissed. And then you've got the studies of – there's so many others. There's founding church fathers. Oregon believed it. Um, uh, there's another guy. Uh, oh, my gosh. The, the list is so huge. But it's okay. It doesn't matter. It's part of the journey. It's part of the journey. It explains predestination. Oh, if you could, oh, there's so many things I could show you. Just, but that, you know what? It's irrelevant because we're here to talk about your book. And honestly, well, it's goodness, certainly intriguing. <laughs> it, it is intriguing. And we we had uh, Michael Heiser on the show, and he said, "Well, I've had a lot of people uh, kind of point point that out, you know. And uh, I have entertained that thought, but I'm I'm simply not able to derive that." conclusively from the Hebrew text. And I was laughing. I'm like, I know, because guess what? You don't discern spiritual things by looking at the text. You, know? you discern spiritual things through the spirit. You know, and I and uh, let me tell you something, man. The first person that came along and told me this, I thought that guy was a raving heretic lunatic, and I told him so. <laughs> I wasn't very nice about <laughs> well, it. Well, no, so. it is, it is, uh, it is um, uh, of great interest to me that Jesus does seem to be referencing, specifically referencing, when he tells the Pharisees, you are gods, that he does specifically seem to be referencing Psalm 82. So there is something there. And, uh, you know, I, 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 at this point in time, and, and probably in Heiser's camp on this, that, uh, that he's, he's, he's addressing what I would consider our elder siblings, um, but but it's, it's again it's it's intriguing and um, and I'm certainly not uh, the kind of person that gets uh, I don't get uh, frustrated or angry or when when people have uh, opinions and ideas that are unfamiliar to me I find it actually it's thrilling to me because it's it's it causes it me to have to 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 you know double check your your paradigm. I've t- I opened up this program, believe it or not, I opened up this program explaining to people that I have had to be wrong hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times to get to the way- place that I'm at right now, which is probably still wrong. <laughs> okay. And, and, you know, I mean, starting out not even believing in aliens and now knowing as a fact that it, as it says in Daniel, I think it's Daniel 2.43, 2.41, there's two, two references to, I saw a watcher and a holy one. Well, everybody thinks a watcher is evil. Everybody thinks a watcher is a fallen angel. That is a wrong answer. Right. Wrong. Mm, wrong, that, wrong. That's wrong, for sure. Wrong. Mm, that's for sure. That's for <laughs> you know sure. What I'm saying? Yeah. So then, so then guess what? Oh, my gosh. Oh, oh man. There's so much I can share with you. I, I don't, yeah, the watchers, are, the watchers are passing judgment on Nebuchadnezzar. In the Bible, yes. uh, they're, they're they're sentencing him. These are the good guys. Yep, yep. You know, so 
Listen to this. So this will they're the ones who who hand down the sentence, and he where he's where he becomes he loses his mind and eats grass like a like a like a cow. Um, yeah. That was the Watchers who passed yep. down that sentence. Oh, I got. Oh, and so the Watchers are the good guys, but among the Watchers, there's a there are factions. It's like any other. It's yes. like it's like it, 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 we're all familiar with this concept. I mean. You got good guys and bad guys in in, in in a lot of organizations, and among and among these, the the, the watchers, there's there were an, an, a, there was an insubordinate faction and an insurrection, yes. and so yes, they're both watchers, the good and the bad. Yep. Um, yep. And the bad are 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 the bad are at enmity with God, and the good are loyal. We you had know? this. This was mo- one of the most mind bending things that ever happened to me. I, I've had a bunch of them over the years. Thank you, Jesus. But anyway. Um, we had this lady come on the show, and she wrote a couple of really interesting books, and um, she was given her testimony, and her and her roommate, were, which were both Pentecostals and baptized in the Holy Spirit and the whole deal, they uh, were meeting with another worldly being. Now, uh, at that time, I was of the persuasion that even if they were – no matter what, 100%. I mean, I'm accepting that I, I already knew aliens are aliens. I knew that they could have children and families and hundreds, you know, m- even arguably millions of years of existence, which made total sense because the Luciferian rebellion happened so long ago. That I mean, there are people who live in Sweden right now who don't, who have been born through, you know, five, ten generations of unbelievers that totally think Jesus is a myth. Totally think he's a myth. Don't know anything about him. Don't know him from from a hole in the ground, because their parents, 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 his parents, parents, great, 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 great grandfathers were all atheists. Well, if you look at that from the paradigm of the Luciferian rebellion and the wars in the heavens, that means that there's probably who knows hundreds of thousands, if not more, life forms, species of beings that were involved in the original Luciferian rebellion. They don't remember. Mm, I agree. It. They don't remember it. But that doesn't mean they're not. Well, I don't know if they don't dead. remember it. I would agree with the first part of that statement that there were certainly uh, that there, that there were certainly factions involved. It wasn't just a few yes. a handful of, uh, of, of angels. It was, there was there was you know take the word principality for example in the Bible. And if you if you think about the word principality, we've misconstrued the word principality. In the charismatic circles, especially, we think that a principality is an entity, when in reality, a principality is the realm of a prince. That's what a principality is, and nothing else. That's and so, true. when the Bible talks about principalities, it's talking about realms that are governed by princes. And and so, when these princes rebelled, uh, they they drew their realms into their rebellion. I mean, this was a galactic war. That's from it my perspective. Was. This was this was a a, a a cosmic battle, a galactic war. It was like an epic it was battle. Like it was just a handful of guys. Did you know? Did I'm you sorry? know that Ronberry? It was it was Star Trek. It was Star Wars. They, this stuff is people think it, this is science fiction. They don't understand. Look, there was a woman by the name uh, her name, and I bring this up all the time. Her name is Phyllis Schlemmer. I think she just passed away. Now, when when, I'm just going to say, when a Jesus person hears from God, they call it a prophecy. When a unbeliever hears from a fallen angelic being, they call it channeling. Nevertheless, both of them are a form of telepathy. Now, that being said, let's simplify our, our terminology. This woman by the name of Phyllis Schlemmer, who, quote, channeled fallen angelic beings – wrote a book entitled The Only Planet of Choice. In that book, she explains how she was meeting with the Council of Nine. Lucifer had an ephod with nine gemstones in it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when she asked them, who are you? They said, you would know us as those referred to in the ancient Hebrew texts. They could have mentioned a thousand different texts. They mentioned the Hebrew text. Here's the clincher. Do you know who was in the room with her? Gene Roddenberry. 
Gene Roddenberry got almost every one of his ideas for the original Star Trek series from his channeling mm. sessions with Phyllis Schlemmer while she was talking to fallen angelic beings. No, that's very interesting. <laughs> no kidding, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. It just confirms your work. Hallelujah. That's awesome. Yeah, and let me you. let me ask you a question, but before we run out of time, I gotta circle back to something you said because I'm still processing you. You were talking about your experience with the uh with the uh, what'd you call them? The bot the botnets and and oh, uh, yeah. you were you were cycling through these this yeah. this 3D interface, cycling through the yeah. botnets, right? Is that what they are, botnets? Yeah, botnets, yeah. Is that what you call them? Yeah, and so yeah. and then you got to the end and you found a disclosure something dot org. When you yeah. when you when you're talking about that website, first of all, is are you referring to Richard I mean uh, Stephen Greer's website? Is that what you're referring to? No. No, yes. no. Um no, the the disclosureproject.org, the actual terminology, the phrase the the phrase the disclosure project. That was Stephen Greer's baby. That was when he got the uh National News Corp yeah. together and brought yeah. all the people with the testimonies from yeah. the military forward, right? But was but that when he did the out of out of the Atacama being Pardon? Is that the documentary where he featured that little little alien looking thing? No, no, I didn't really watch that. I wasn't really into that. I, I okay. No, I, yeah. I I just I just I just actually condensed what you were saying in my mind. So yes, that was a function of the disclosure project. Yes. Yeah, so you're talking about this yeah. the broader disclo- the, the 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 broader disclosure project where he brought everybody together and they did the testimony on Capitol Hill and all of that kind of stuff. Yeah, but but my my actual mentioning of it was because God speaks. Look, Einstein said it, but I live it. It's my life. It's been my life for a very long time. Einstein said that a coincidence is God's way of staying anonymous, but it's bigger than that. God speaks to us in that still small voice in potentially dozens of coincidences per day through street signs, through things that people say, unbelievers as well as believers, and if we're walking in a spiritual walk and we're sensitive to that spiritual touch, we will start to see these many miracles all over our lives. And it's only when we start to acknowledge them as the Lord speaking to us, that is the beginning of our supernatural walk in communion with the Lord. If 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 we have died in Christ, it is no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. Greater is He that is in me than He He that is in the world. Ephesians three twenty. Now to Him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. So it's the power that works in us that allows Jesus to do what He does. We are His ambassadors on this earth. We walk with the Godhead as a part of our energy. If we are born of the water and of the spirit, water being water of the woman, when the water breaks, she gives birth. And of the spirit Mm -hmm. means that we are born again in the spirit. When you are that, you are already communing with the Godhead. The Godhead is a part of you. That's why it says in 1 Peter 2.9, you are a royal priesthood. It doesn't say you're going to become one. It says you are. That's why it says in Matthew 18, 18, it says, that which is bound on earth is bound in heaven. That which is loosed on earth is loosed in heaven. How is that even possible? It's because we have the ability through our communion with the Godhead to operate in the courts of heaven in our prayers. We are far more powerful on this earth than we realize that we are. And that really gets super duper exciting. <laughs> <laughs> And man, it it just takes it takes our existence on this earth to a whole nother level. And then you bring in your understanding, what the Lord showed you in your walk. Which man, I would have done anything to go to the Amazon. Man, that is like big time on my bucket list. Oh it man, it sounds great until you're in. The, it sounds great until you're being devoured by mosquitoes at a, in eight I o'clock know. in the evening. I know. I've seen the movies. I have. I've seen the movies with the mosquito part of it, and I'm like, oh my gosh, that's horrible. You know, people completely. Yeah, I've had up. malaria five times, yellow fever once, oh. so oh. it's not. Uh, you know, it's more grueling than it is anything else. But uh, oh, it's a crucible. I, I, I can only imagine there was this movie. 
it was about two men that left. They they were on a tour through the Amazon, and they had a guide. I don't know if it was two or three men, and they had a guide with them, but something went wrong. They got into a fight. Some Something broke, and they got lost as they were trying to find their way back, and I watched that movie. I was riveted. I was riveted, and man, did they suffer. Oh, man. Oh, I can only imagine, but that sounds so exciting. 